Welcome back to Block TV. It's time now for Crypto Globe, where we take a trip around the world and hear about the latest developments in the industry. And to guide us on this tour de force, I am joined by the one and only Ethan Pierce, director of the Paris-based Crypto Assets Institute, today talking to us from Dayton, Ohio. Ethan, a Merry Christmas to you, a Happy Holidays, yeah. and firstly, welcome happy holidays. back to Block TV. All right. Always so a good thing. Absolute pleasure, as always. And to kick us off uh, this week, we're starting with a story coming out of South Korea, where the largest telecom company in that country is developed a blockchain-based local currency for one of the major cities, Busan. This story seems to have a number of layers to it, so help us break it down, Ethan. What does it all mean? So we've talked a lot about in the past uh, couple months that they created this blockchain um, kind of economic development zone in Busan. Um, talked about the fact that Korea has been very blockchain friendly, uh, but but maybe cr not necessarily crypto friendly uh, for a lot of these things. And so, uh, but we see things moving um, more and more forward uh, uh, along with the idea the, around regulation for crypto assets and, and, and a willingness to embrace that more and more. Uh, but the blockchain stuff is really scaling significantly. And a lot of, you know, pretty much every large corporate in Korea is doing something in the space. There's all kinds of projects across pretty much any of the verticals that you can think of. Um, and so this one, uh, taking one of the largest telecom companies uh, along with the second largest city and coming up with, uh, basically this is a blockchain based uh, digital currency for to facilitate small business payments. And so the idea is it has its own wallet uh, and it also, well, not really a wallet, more a payment app, um, kind of a wallet. Um, it's not a cryptocurrency in the, in the pure sense, but, uh, the, and then it also works with the two largest banks. And the idea is to encourage small business uh, engagement and spending. Um, they've developed this uh, digital currency to work with. And so it actually will work in pretty much any um, store or restaurant or wherever across Busan that has a credit card terminal, um, with the exception of the larger malls and department stores, because they want to uh, basically stimulate uh, small business um, spending. And so it's not a super complex story in the sense that uh, uh, there's not a lot of uh, newness to the idea. It's significant because of its scale. Uh, Busan is, I think, three and a half million people. Uh, this is the largest telecom, uh, as we said, in, in Korea. So the marriage of these two things is a very significant deployment. This is not a beta. Uh, this is going live. Um, I think in uh, December on December 30th. So uh, this is a very interesting um, scaled out uh, blockchain based mm. payment solution. Um, I think that's pretty cool to, to, to see this kind of development and this kind of push. I also think that it will. Um, this is the kind of thing to encourage uh, other people to build solutions, whatever they might be around the blockchain and around digital currency. Uh, in this case, one of the ways they're going to stimulate it is, is it's it's kind of like an Apple card. Uh, you get six percent back uh, whenever you. Uh, um, use this digital currency. So you're getting 6% cash back uh, by, by switching over to using this uh, payment system. So by, by kind of pushing um, the adoption in that way, they should get a pretty quick adoption of using this. And you know, those kind of behavior changes will just enable, um, uh, facilitate that much more other people building really cool solutions and people just kind of becoming agnostic to how they pay for things. Um, or that that store of or transfer of value is is coming from. Um, mm -hmm. I think this could have some pretty significant uh, uh, impact, and we're going to see many other things. Kakao, which is the largest internet company um, uh, in the region, is also coming up with its Clayton uh, cryptocurrency this next year. Uh, and I think we're going to see a whole lot more mm -hmm. interesting things. This is not tradable. So, you know, this is going around the crypto problems that uh, Korea has, has has historically, you know, not really um, supported or wanted to, to encourage. And, and so uh, this isn't crypto in that sense, um, but it's, it's just about the idea of building a digital currency. And while we keep talking about central bank digital currencies and how much cool stuff is, is and will happen in that space, this is a regional mm. uh, version of that, not backed by the government um, um, at all right. uh, in that sense. Uh, it's, it's a project of the government, but it's a large corporate plus uh, the financial sector, the banks, 
uh, that are making this happen. Right, certainly a, uh, a push from the private sector, uh, a different way of approaching this, but having that large scale investment always important. But turning now uh, to France, where they're taking a bit of a different uh, approach, this coming from a more top down uh, governmental approach with a financial watchdog approving the first ICO under a new visa scheme. Now, this is an interesting one to me, Ethan, because a government actually approving an ICO lends some credibility uh, to the space, to the idea, perhaps some uh, investment uh, fortitude and security for those looking to invest in this particular coin. Uh, what can you make of all this? So the uh, we talked about uh, this a bit back in um, the spring whenever the PACT law was passed. So the PACT is an economic development law that covers all kinds of things in the French economy. Uh, but they included a, a lot of very interesting um, uh, perspective and uh, regulation to allow us to start having more clarity about how to deal with um, crypto in general in France. And one of those things with this ICO visa, so the AMF is... Uh, the monetary authority uh, of, of Singapore, uh, Singapore <laughs> stuck in my, in my countries, uh, of France, and this, you know, kind of like the SEC in some ways, but not exactly, uh, but they're the ones that are responsible for um, anything related to, to uh, offering up a, an investment scheme, uh, whether it is institutional, uh, accredited, or, or uh, even more so towards retail investors. And so by providing this, uh, this ICO visa, the concept was uh, they're building a, a framework that allows you to, if you tick all the boxes um, and you have a white paper that investors can easily understand, uh, you've got the appropriate custody solutions in place, um, and everything is, is being done in a way that uh, validates the integrity of uh, the company of the ICO. So not the business model itself, because that's, that's just um, entrepreneurship. So these things will uh, work or will not work, and that's just how that will go. But at least you're not going to deal with companies that don't exist or that have lazy uh, custody of the, of the capital that they're being given through the ICO or other things, and or just kind of this gibberish kind of white papers full of lots of complicated but not terribly actually accurate or realistic things. So all of that then allows you to get a stamp of approval um, to be whitelisted from the AMF. And that whitelisting allows you to do lots of different things, will allow you to more easily get a bank account. I saw somewhere that it was saying that this gives you a guaranteed bank account. According to what I read and the, and the people that I spoke to at the AMF, that's that's not the case. They can't force a bank to give you a bank account. But what this does is this re this removes the um, the first the, the risk potential for the bank to have given a project a bank account to a crypto project by by you know at least you've been whitelisted by the monetary authority so they're going to be much more likely to open up that system to you but it will do other things as well um, if you are whitelisted like this particular one this France ICO is, is the name of the ICO I'll explain in a second then um, that will allow you to uh, be able to go to retail investors and to have the stamp of approval that you're at least a valid business. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, this is this is not talking about tokenized securities and security tokens. It's not talking about you know other certain things. This is very much focused just around utility tokens. We know that most of that is has dried up in the sense of it, it, you know running uh, token offerings is one thing. Um, getting people to invest in them is another. So it will be interesting to see where these where these go. Uh, these are not large. This is a million euros, uh, the one that's coming up with France ICO, which actually in and of itself is a platform for raising capital through ICOs. So the first one that they're that they're whitelisting is actually a platform that would then go on to help others um, to do this. Uh, I think you know, this continues the trend that I've that I've highlighted that I think France is becoming mm -hmm. one of the 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 coolest places in Europe to potentially do anything in the tokenized space, uh, especially eventually around tokenized securities, but anything in crypto, if you're dealing with B2B, because you need to have the large corporates, the large financial institutions trust you, have, uh, uh, you know, with risk tolerance to be much more able to to engage with you uh, uh, from a regulatory standpoint, standpoint, all these kind of things. Um, I think that, that the law, the PAC law and, and the things that they continue to do and, and will follow up with this on in terms of regulation will create a much more clear and transparent situation for people who are doing business right. in that space, especially B2B. B2C, um, we'll see. Uh, it might be a little expensive on the tax side, but uh, on the flip side, you know exactly what you're getting um, mm -hmm. from the regulators and you've got a very clear path to have a conversation. They're very accessible. So I think this is really exciting. Um, I, I, 
little it's it's sad that the, the word ICO keeps being attached to it because right. that's kind of dried up everywhere else. But that's certainly, okay. Um, yeah, certainly it has some uh, some sort of limiting uh, connotations, as it were, some negative connotations from the past. But now turning uh, quickly over to China, where authorities have seized uh, nearly seven thousand crypto mining machines in a country that has uh, around two thirds of the uh, Bitcoin hash rate uh, power inside the state, a worrying sign potentially for some. They say they're consu these miners were consuming electricity illegally. Uh, what's the deal with this story, Ethan? What can you tell us? So we have seen um, a certain crackdown on miners around the fact that uh, on the crypto side, as far as exchanges being illegal or or the mining activities being illegal in certain regional governments. Uh, there has been a crackdown on the mining itself in some places. This particular uh, case is actually just about uh, electricity theft. So because you're having to register, potentially pay a higher price for electricity, which is still really low in, in this particular region, um, the you know, people are, are going around that even still and, 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 and tapping into electricity where they can and siphoning that off. So basically, um, they, as they see that, they monitor that, that, that there are weird peaks of electricity usage in places and they go and track it down. You know, some of these miners are using, you know, one miner is using the same electricity as, as, a, as a single household or, or, or dozens of households. So they're noticing this peak, you know, um, rather easily whenever they switch over to different, you know, whenever they're moving the electricity sources around. Uh, this was really at this point just about uh, the fact that they were not uh, legally allowed to be using the electricity that they were taking. They weren't paying for it. It was that kind of a thing. It's not specifically related to, you know, shutting down crypto mining per se. But I think this is a very interesting story just because it highlights, you know, 7,000 is a lot of machines, but it's not, um, I mean, that it's it's still only a, a small fraction of, 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 of what's out there. But when we look at the fact that just in four regions in China, we have 65% of the world's hash rate. And in fact, just one of them, Sichuan, uh, is 50% of the world. So the other, the other three just make the other 15%. So when you look at what could happen if we see wholesale shutting down of network access, uh, uh, in terms of um, Bitcoin uh, or other uh, eventual um, crypto uh, uh, processing in that sense, the, that's, that's problematic when we talk about sovereign um, plays into the Bitcoin or crypto space. Uh, if you're basing your economy, or if you're tying any kind of um, monetary policy or any, anything to uh, whether it's Bitcoin or eventually other uh, things. And the mining of that particular uh, cryptocurrency or, or, or coin is controlled this much by another government, more or less. Um, their ability to shut that down in and of itself can cause severe um, uh, economic problems for uh, governments uh, or uh, large corporations or, or other um, platforms that are leveraging this. So. I don't, it's not really an anti-crypto mining thing in this particular case, but I do think it highlights the problem of having, you know, what happens when we have that much of the, of the hash rate focused in, in one single right. place and the ability for that to get, uh, not, not even manipulated, but simply just removed um, and what that could potentially do um, to uh, the availability of the network to, you know, this is not enough to make that happen, but, but in the eventual, 65%, however, <laughs> Um, there's there, a lot could be done to really slow down um, uh, Bitcoin uh, transactions mm -hmm. uh, by by affecting this or limiting this, limiting it by geography, uh, all kinds of things that could potentially, you know, th this for me, I see it more as kind of, you know, this is why we need to have more of this around the world, which is why Bitma Bitmain is opening the, the largest uh, crypto mine in Texas, why the Nordics are, are going um, uh, super, super fast and strong towards more and more uh, mines with, with great access to, to, to cheap power. I think this is really important for uh, sovereign, uh, uh, for countries that are looking for, to put any of their economy in any way attached to crypto, uh, that we protect that sovereignty by having um, the hash rate of these things distributed as much as possible around the world. Um, so, anyways, interesting story. Uh, uh, we'll see how much this mm. more continues, but they continue to crack down on this in China. So I think this won't be the last time we hear about uh, uh, medium to large seizures of equipment. 
Certainly, it doesn't seem like China will be leaving the headlines anytime soon. Uh, Ethan Pierce, uh, director of the Paris-based Crypto Assets Institute, I want to thank you so much for joining us this week on Block TV, and I'm sure we'll have plenty more to discuss next week. In the meantime, stay with us at blocktv.com for all the latest in news and information. I'm Asher Westrop Evans, and thanks for watching. For more news and updates, follow us on Twitter.